Camilla Temple, tonight's speaker, is a um, biologist, a conservationist, and an author. She grew up in Souk, so she's a local girl, and she did her Bachelor's of Science and Master's of Science here in the Department of Biology at UVic. And after graduating, she's traveled the world, um, she's become a scientific writer, she's been to the tops of the mountains in Ethiopia, she's been to the salmon streams of the Great Bay Rainforest, and um, at the moment she's living in Bristol in, in England, and she's back here, we're very happy that she's back to launch, this is the Canadian launch of her new book, and I'd like to welcome her to UVic, and we're very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Barbara. Um, this is officially more than just my family, so this is very exciting. <laughs> Thank you all for coming on a Friday night. I'm going to, um, I have to change the slides, so I'm going to be doing a bit of dancing up here. Um, my co-author Richard couldn't be here this evening. Uh, he doesn't have family to stay with, so he had to stay in England. So I'm here, and I'm very happy to be here back on UVic campus and enjoying the incredible beauty that Victoria has to offer. I sure miss it. Um, so as Barbara mentioned, I earned my degree here at UVic in biology and I went on to work for about 10 years in conservation um, biology, first in Canada's Great Bear Rainforest, which was pretty spectacular, and then in Australia's Coral Sea. So one might wonder why one would go from amazing pristine temperate rainforest to pristine coral reefs to a home office in Bristol <laughs> writing about all the horrible things people do to food. And I have wondered this myself many times. So I did try to get into conservation biology when we moved to the UK, but as it turns out, conservation um, in the UK is about restoring really nice big fancy houses or putting hedgerows up. So it wasn't terribly inspiring. So I turned to what I really do love to do, and that is write. Um, and one of my first jobs as a science writer was to interview a professor at the University of Bristol, Richard Evershed. And he analyzes fat deposits on all the clay materials, the pottery that they dig up from archaeological sites, looking at how those fat deposits have been used. So were they actually cheese or yogurt? And it turns out that this, the analytical methods that he used to do that, to trace the history of dairying, could also be applied to looking for food fraud. And in the 1990s, the UK government went to supermarket shelves and they pulled off corn oil off the shelves, brand names, big names, they pulled off 79 bottles of them and they tested them and they found out that 35% of the corn oil had had a cheaper oil, canola oil added, but they couldn't tell how much. And they were presenting this issue at um, a conference and Richard said, I can, use, I can use those methods to find out exactly how much of the um, canola oil, sorry, it's rapeseed oil in the UK, <laughs> so I'm trying to struggle with interpretation here. Um, canola oil in, in the corn oil, and he did so. And he was able to do it down, he could detect down to levels of 3%, so as, as little as 3% uh, of the um, rapeseed oil, <laughs> canola oil in the corn oil. And he didn't, change anything. He just announces, the government said, okay, we're not going to change any legislation, we're not going to change any policies, just go out and tell people. So he presented this information, the fact that he had this new test to different conferences and industry workshops, and lo and behold, five years later, the government goes back onto the supermarket shelves, they start to pull the oil off, none of it has been adulterated. So without any changes whatsoever, just knowing that there's this new sophisticated analytical method on the market, it changed what people were doing. So it's sort of an indication of just how powerful science can be. Right, so. Um, this was my first introduction to food fraud and it was uh, very enlightening. I was a bit ignorant. I didn't understand that this was gonna be happening in, I mean, this was something that happened in other countries, not, not a country that I lived in. And However, in 2013, hence the cover of the book, many of you will have heard of the horse meat scandal that happened in Europe. So um, there was some random testing that happened in Ireland, 
and what they found was that a lot of processed products, lasagna, beef bolognese, uh, hamburgers, they were detecting horse meat, even though they were labeled as beef products. And this was outrageous to the British public. There was also pig in there, but nobody really made a fuss about that. That wasn't nearly as good a headline for the media. So there was this outrage. Richard went to a, a Royal Society of Chemistry meeting and they were discussing the horse meat scandal and he was outraged. Outraged that on the labels, even on labels that we had, they were hiding cheaper ingredients all the time. And he called me up and he was so angry and he said, I just, you know, I, I can't believe this. We need to do something about this. And I said, yes, someone needs to write a book. And I looked at my inbox and I said, it's not going to be me. <laughs> and then, lo and behold, Bloomsbury Publishing was looking for some new ideas and I shamelessly pitched Richard's idea and they loved it. And so suddenly, someone's got to write a book went to, we're writing a book. And then it was like, we're writing a book. <laughs> uh, we have to write a book. So that's where it is. So tonight I'm here to tell you a little a bit about the science behind detecting food fraud because that is actually the main issue that doesn't get talked about in the media. Um, however, it's also not necessarily the most interesting part. So I'm going to try and introduce some really disgusting examples and it would be very useful if you go, ooh, so that I know that I have chosen the right examples. I, I like to hear that feedback. Um, and I'm also going to tell you some of the reasons that I think that we are very vulnerable to food fraud now. It's not, an, it's not a new concept, but perhaps we're seeing a lot more of it for certain reasons. But mainly I'm here because I want to arm everybody with some knowledge. Not only about what's possible, because I think that's really important to understand just the many different ways we can get scammed, but also to talk about what we can do as consumers, because we can't always point the finger at governments and industry. There's things, choices we make, because ultimately we're the ones that decide what food goes in our mouth. So let's first make sure that we all understand what food fraud is. So, it, in its most basic form, there's some very fancy uh, definitions out there about econo economically motivated adulteration, um, but it all comes down to substituting cheaper ingredients for more expensive ingredients. That might be adding some water, plumping up your scallops with some added water so that people are paying for water rather than scallop could be misrepresenting how a food was produced. So if it's organic, whether it's a um, free range egg, but in fact it is actually a cage egg. It can be misrepresenting where it's been grown. So this is a case that's ongoing in Ontario right now where um, a family farm with a bunch of greenhouses has been selling veg and uh, fruit for years, saying that it was locally grown on their farms. People are willing to pay a little bit more for that product, but in fact, they were importing it from Mexico. So, <gasps> well done, thank you. <laughs> God, if that shocked you, you are in for a treat. <laughs> Wait for this next one. I don't even have a picture of it, so gross. Okay, so it can be repurposing meat. So in between 1995 and 2001, a gentleman, very entrepreneurial man in the UK, named Maggot Pete. He was named for uh, the fact that he kept a maggot farm, not because of what he did later in life, but he probably would have warranted it then too. So he had a license to take all of the waste products from um, the poultry processing and turn it into pet food, but he suddenly realized that in fact there was a lot more money in turning that into human food. And so he would take waste, the stuff that had low, low, low grade waste, stuff that had been deemed unusable for humans, and he would bring it to his, uh, apparently the description is, you know, just an old, hideous, disgusting shed in the back. They would trim off the really disgusting parts. They would dip it in bleach because it, of course, had turned green and had a nice tinge to it. And then they would package it up and they would send it off for human consumption. Yummy. You'll be glad I don't have a picture of that. He had 600 different um, vendors that he sold to. Those people were often, mostly, they were um, caterers to the uh, schools and hospitals. So they were feeding the most vulnerable part of the population with this rancid meat, for lack of a better word. Um, and he sold, over that six years, half a million kilos, made millions from it. And that happens all over the world. 
It can also be just the plain substitution of a product. So one of the things that have been targeted around the world lately is oregano. And can I say that it's very nice to say oregano. I've been doing talks in the UK and I have to say oregano. <laughs> so <laughs> oregano, and, and so much of it has up to 70% of the oregano, which is not, I mean, this is not an expensive product. And it's been adulterated with myrtle leaves, olive leaves, and in fact, consumers prefer the look of that adulterated stuff because it's a brighter green. So, um, and it's been going on for years and they're finding it all around the world. So these are all examples of types of food fraud, the ways we can get swindled. Um, and all of it comes down to poisoning or cheating, essentially. Um, and I am now way over here on my pages. So the concept of poisoning and cheating isn't a new one, as I said. It's probably happened since our very first ancestors uh, had a surplus of food that they were growing and began to trade it and saw an opportunity. Uh, it was certainly recorded in Roman times. They used to sweeten sour wine with lead, which may have explained why some of them were sterile. Um, and in the 19th century London, food fraud was absolutely rampant. It was almost the norm. So late at night on a Saturday, markets weren't open on Sunday, so Saturday night they would try and get rid of any food that was gonna go um, to waste over the weekend. So um, the working class got paid on Saturday, so they would go to the market Saturday night. The vendors would put a fresh layer of fat over top of the rancid meat to make it look a little fresher. They would sell it off. They would add alum to bread to make it look like it was a more expensive bleached flour. And um, my personal favorite was that they used to um, have such poor quality beer that they would add picrotoxin, which is, comes from a fruit from a <coughs> tropical vine. And um, it would give that sense of being inebriated. It would make your lips tingle and it would make you feel a bit stumbly. <laughs> and it was because it was such a low, low quality beer, they, they added this in so that people at least thought that they were getting um, intoxicated. And this was, in particular, this one was outrageous to a chemist by the name of Frederick Kuhn, because he was German and he absolutely loved beer. And he also liked public displays of chemistry, which I frankly think there needs to be more of these days. But he went around and he started to gather all this stuff from the markets and he took it home and he would test it. And what he found was very revolting to him. Um, and so he ended up writing a book and he published it in 1820 um, and it was the Treatise on the Adulterations of Food. And it included, it's, it's a really great book actually, should have just redone this one really. Um, and it has a whole bunch of kitchen experiments that um, you, could, you could do to just test whether your food had been adulterated. And this is a great example which I actually did at home. So peppercorns, at the time were a very expensive commodity and were prone to adulteration, still are actually. And one of the things that they can be adulterated with is dried papaya seeds. So uh, I'll give you a hint, I did this and I was too lazy to clean the papaya seeds very well. So there's an indicator that on the left you'll see some bits of dried papaya <laughs> to the seeds. So the ones on the left are the dried papaya seeds, ones on the right, peppercorns. It's, it's not a great picture actually, but it seems fairly clear, right? Okay, mix them in together. 20% pep papaya seeds in amongst the peppercorns. I'm not sure that I would be looking out for that. And 20% is gonna really improve your profit margins. So it doesn't take much. But Akum found out that in fact, peppercorns sink when you put them in a glass of water and papaya seeds float. So simple as. Um, Right, so unfortunately a lot has changed since Akum's time. Food is far more complicated these days. On a supermarket shelf we have anywhere between 30 and 40,000 items. Um, and these items have come from all around the world. Any one of those items has a, an extensive list of ingredients which have also been sourced from around the world. So um, it, there are things actually on the supermarket shelves that Akum probably wouldn't even recognize as being food. So. We have changed it a lot. So let's jump into an example. And I'm going to start with the horse meat. So as I mentioned earlier, um, Europe and the UK in particular, 
could talk about nothing else in 2013. And I just want to clarify, people ha have um, questioned, they're like, well, people eat horse all the time. And that was also brought up during the scandal. And it's like, well, it wasn't the issue that we were eating horse. It was more the issue that we were told it was beef. <laughs> Um, in fact, apparently, horse is quite lean and lovely to eat, not that I would know. But um, So they tested a bunch of ready-made meals, as I said. A third of the meals tested contained horse. Some of them contained 100% horse. There was a lasagna brand that was no beef whatsoever. As it turned out, 85% of the meals that they tested contained pig. But that wasn't nearly as exciting, as I said. Uh, but it was a very big issue, obviously, for um, the Muslim community and other people who choose not to eat pig. So when this scandal broke, we wanted desperately to point fingers as to who had done it, who done it. And what we discovered, and there were some journalists at The Guardian who were very integral in unraveling this, was that it's very complicated. Uh, this was one part, one very small part of the food chain that happened. So, UK orders ready-made lasagnas from Camigle in France. Camigle says, okay, but we're going to get a company in Luxembourg to make them. The company in Luxembourg calls Spang Hero in southern France and says, we'd like some meat. Spang Hero calls a meat trader in Cyprus, who then subcontracts that out to a meat trader in the Netherlands who then orders the meat from Romania. All right, that's just the paperwork. Romania, the abattoir, then sends it to Spang Hero and then it goes off to Luxembourg. The point is that it's very complex and I just wanna say that the subcontractor in um, the Netherlands, their name was, D, was DRAP, D-R-A-A-P, which apparently is horse in uh, Dutch, backwards. So <laughs> I... <laughs> I'm not sure, I don't want to say anything, but I would start there. Um, so this is the first reason that we're vulnerable to food fraud. We have very, very complex food chains. In fact, they're not even complete, they're not even chains, they are networks. Um, now, second example. We come over here to Canada, and it was DNA, which I failed to mention, it was DNA testing, I think, that um, revealed the horse in the beef products. And Canada has a link to that because in fact the DNA methods that have been pioneered for um, food, detecting food fraud, particularly species swapping, which is what you would use DNA for, has been done by the University of Guelph. And they started to um, do something known as DNA barcoding. So researchers all over the world are constantly sequencing genes because we want to know what they're doing. And um, they'll be sequencing whatever gene they happen to be interested in. The concept behind barcoding is that everybody sequences one particular gene. And when we have that sequence, it, this is, you'll get a list of all those C's, G's, T's, A's, the nucleic acids, it comes out in a great big long line. And then we can compare that to a database and we can say, okay, it's, it's the species. So that's the idea. The thing is you need to choose the right gene. It's sort of like Goldilocks in the porridge. You wanna choose a gene that uh, is long enough. You wanna choose a gene that has enough variation, enough mutations that you can tell the different species apart, but also not so many mutations that there's so much variability within a species. So the group at Guelph chose an enzyme called, uh, chose a uh, gene for an enzyme called coenzyme 1, CO1. And it works, you'll see the, there's sort of the code, it's 650 base pairs long, so I, I didn't put them all on there. Um, and then below you sort of get a code, and it, it looks just like the barcode that you would see on a food product, okay? So this is the method that they use, but you need to have that database. You need to have one's specimens that have been done by experts, that have been recognized by experts to say, yes, this is what it is. And so they started to develop their database for a couple of years, and then they went and said, okay, how mature is our database? Is it mature enough that if we went into the market and pulled a sample of fish out, would we be able to tell what species it is? So they did just that. They went out into the Toronto area and even a couple of retailers in New York and they got some samples 
and they brought them back to the lab and they tested them. And they found out two things. First of all, that their database was mature enough to identify every single one of the specimens that they sequenced. And the second thing that they learned was that one in every four of them was mislabeled. And they thought, oh, that's a bit weird. So they thought, well, maybe Toronto's just corrupt. <laughs> and so they went out and they used journalists from around Canada. They got them um, journalists and other researchers, a bunch of people to send them samples from all over Canada to see whether this, um, this phenomenon happened uh, across Canada. They got 236 samples. They tested them all, 41% of them were mislabeled. Now there are 30,000 plus species of fish. It's the most species vertebrate on the planet. So it could be just error. There's a lot of fish out there. However, it was almost exclusively always a cheaper fish being substitute, substituted for a more expensive fish. So highly unlikely. And as an example of that, Labrador redfish, um, at the time was valued at 56 cents a kilo and it was being sold as red snapper which is valued at over seven dollars a kilo. That's a pretty good profit margin. <laughs> and the reason that they could get away with this, well I'll get back to that in a second, but there's environmental implications for this. So not only are people getting swindled and, and paying for something that they're not getting, there's environmental implications. So suddenly you have a market for less desirable species, maybe even illegally caught species, species that are perceived to be less sustainable, particularly in Victoria, we're very, very, um, you know, we're, we're conscious, conscientious consumers and, and we look at the sustainability of foods. So if you have something on your, you know, you, there's David Suzuki Foundation has got a list of the fish that are better for better choices. Um, and so you're, you're, you're being ripped off in your values. Um, it also gives a false impression to consumers about how common a fish is. So if you're seeing red snapper on every menu, even if you're not ordering it, you have this perception that it's actually very available when it not, isn't necessarily the case. It also has health implications. And in 2007, 600 people in Hong Kong uh, got a great deal on Canadian Atlantic cod. Fantastic deal. They also got really sick. What they were eating was oil fish or escalar. It's also known as snake mackerel. And this fish has a lot of waxy esters um, which help it in controlling its buoyancy, various other things. But they're also indigestible to us. So these people got really bad stomach cramps. They started vomiting and your body gets rid of those waxy esters, whether you want to or not, and sometimes unannounced. So as you can imagine, it's not first date food. It was not a pleasant experience. So there, is, there are some serious health implications that surround this as well. And the reason that's happening is because this is what we do. All right, so yeah, there's the, these are all the same fish now processed. And not highly processed. This is highly processed, right? So we take our fish and we remove all the recognizable features. Okay, well, salmon's got pink flesh. There's some things that we can tell. But we like to have it all really pre-prepared. And I had this naive idea as well that um, executive chefs would be going down to their local fishmonger and finding the catch of the day to put on their, on their restaurant menus. And some definitely do that. But for the most part, municipalities uh, charge to get rid of organic waste, charge restaurants to get rid of organic waste, so they, and it costs them money to pay someone to prepare the food. So they order the stuff in perfectly portioned little bits, with un, and they're unrecognizable. So swapping is happening, and it's happening along every single phase of the food supply. Um, and as I said, we do this to it. This is a big issue in the UK. UK loves their fish and chips. And any manner of fish has been battered up and people don't have any clue what it is. So this is the second reason we're getting swindled. We're processing food. Don't get me wrong. Some of the processing that we do has allowed us to preserve and, and um, keep food much longer than we ever would have been able to. There's an argument that maybe that's not a great thing. But 
um, we are getting to the point where we are making food almost unrecognizable. So now, to make sure that the vegetarians and vegans in the audience don't feel like they're immune to food fraud, this is the saffron crocus. Um, and it is, uh, you can see the little threads, the stigma that is the saffron thread that we know. It's painstakingly difficult to go along and collect all of these things, which is why saffron is so incredibly expensive. Um, so while I was researching this book, I came across some saffron in a market that was too good to be true. It was incredibly cheap, and so I had to buy it, knowing full well that I knew I was getting swindled on this, but I needed to bring it home. And again, turning to Akum and his little home remedy tests, I put it to the test. So I had some saffron that I felt confident was true and pure saffron, and that's on the right, and then the saffron that I bought was on the left. Uh, immediately, they both of them, both of them release their yellow color, which is what we love about saffron. But the one on the left clearly released a lot more. And then about 15 minutes later, this was what it looked like. So very bright yellow. The three little threads along the bottom of the plate there have lost, essentially lost their color. So, um, and you can see the saffron on the right, the pure saffron hasn't lost its color at all. And this uh, saffron is obviously one of the most adulterated spices out there. And everything you can imagine has been dyed with toxic dyes, Sudan red and other carcinogenic things to look like saffron, including other parts of the flower, marigolds, other flowers altogether, um, corn silk, meat threads, right? So yeah. vegetarians thinking that they're having some nice saffron rice are actually having a little bit of protein that they weren't expecting. And um, so there's people that are working really hard in very vulnerable countries to produce a genuine product. And then there's other people who are creating fake product, undercutting them, and, and the genuine people are losing their livelihoods. So that's a bit of an issue. So the cheap saffron, I just, I sat there and I watched, and lots of people who were interested in the saffron area would go for the cheaper product. And I think that's one of the other reasons that we have, are vulnerable to food fraud. We're pretty unrealistic about what food should cost. And the most concerning thing about the spice chapter is that it has such incredible reach. So in 2014, in North America and in Europe, um, cumin and paprika were both found to have uh, nut protein in it. And it's, it caused 600,000 pounds of meat to be recalled, um, meat that had been marinated in spices, hundreds and hundreds of products from falafel to Tex-Mex seasoning mixes, um, soups, you name it. Um, all of these products had to be recalled because of this being obviously for people with nut allergies a serious concern. Um, and it wasn't obviously, uh, there was a bit of misconception because nuts quite an expensive thing. They weren't actually using nuts, they were using ground up shells of almonds and peanuts. But of course there can be some protein caught up in, in that shell. Just try and stretch it out. And what happened was that in early 2015, there, was, um, there were some really yo low yields of uh, cumin because it got really hot. And this is, I think, the fourth reason that we are very vulnerable to food fraud. Environmental uncertainty. A lot of our spices are grown in, ver in, in countries that are most prone to environmental change, climate change. Um, and we're gonna see lots of uh, things happen where you get low yields, there's still the demand, people are going to get creative in what they produce. Right, so how do we catch these crooks? Okay, we all do chemical analyses, we do them every day. You go into the fridge, the milk is expired yesterday, what do you do? 
have a sniff, right? So we have this incredibly sophisticated piece of analytical equipment right in the middle of our face, right? And we use it. So we smell it, but then we compare it to our own personal database of what milk should taste like, right? Or smell like, sorry, of what it should smell like. Getting ahead of myself. And you compare it to all the times you've smelt good milk, all the times you've smelt bad milk, and you're like, okay, yeah, that's okay. And then you might venture and do a second test. You might taste it, and you do a comparison again with your own personal database. So this is the foundation for analytical science. You need to go out, and with all of the food products, you need to get an understanding, because everything in nature has variation. You need to get an understanding of what that natural variation is and build a database so that you can compare it to. And you want to look for a chemical signature. Some people say fingerprint, but in fact, the chemical, the chemical um, signature of a food can change over time. Think of a bottle of wine. You know? That's going to change as it ages. So it's more of a signature. Our signatures sort of evolve over time. Um, and you're either looking for the signature of the pure food, things that indicate the food is pure, or you're looking for a signature that, that indicates that um, there's something that has been added. Okay. So, keeping that in mind, I'm going to use the simplest food possible. So, you know, don't think of the supermarket shelves with all these incredibly complex ingredients. Honey. We barely do anything. Bees do all the work. And it's one of the top 10 adulterated foods. OK? So first, the first question you have to have is, OK, what, what am I analyzing? Is it protein? Is it sugar? What is it, what is it that I'm looking at? Is it fats? So with honey, it's sugar. Honey is made up of three main sugars, fructose, glucto, glucose, and sucrose. Very little sucrose, less than 3%, actually. And so one of the main ways to adulterate honey, use honey used to be um, sugar water. You and I cannot tell the difference. It's mixed into the honey. But when you do a chemical analysis on it, that sucrose content goes up because all of the sugar that we consume is either beets or cane sugar. So suddenly, that's a, it's a clear indicator. Sucrose off the chart. Easy. No problem. However, people got smarter. The criminals got smarter they started to add high fructose corn syrup, which is what's on the right. You can't really tell a difference. And when you look at, look at the sugars under a chemical analysis, you also can't tell the difference. If you choose the right high fructose corn syrup, it just blends in with that same natural variation. So then you have to get even more sophisticated. So even though your first test is saying, yeah, that's pure, you have to get more complicated. And for that, we turn to, to stable isotopes. So carbon, a lot of elements come in, two, in, in some stable isotopes. So carbon-13 has one extra neutron, then carbon-12, it's a little heavier. So we have two forms of carbon dioxide, in, and that's naturally occurring. There's two different types of plants, C3 plants and C4 plants, and Barbara's going to think this is an incredibly <laughs> easy explanation of this. Most plants are C3, very few plants are C4, but their, their way of capturing that carbon dioxide is slightly different. So they'll, they have a different signature, so some will have more of that, a, a greater ratio of that heavier carbon. And bees are foraging on C3 plants. So honey should have a C3 isotope signature. When you have corn syrup added, then it's going to have this other signature. And you can tell, it's sort of, a, of because of it's a ratio, you can have a sliding scale of exactly how much of that high fructose corn syrup has been added. So that's great. So you get a carbon-4 signature, and you think, ah, I know it. High fructose corn syrup has been added. But wait. Sometimes beekeepers will feed their bees sugar water to get them through tough times. And if you do that, it's again, cane sugar is a C4 plant, so you'll get a C4 signature with that. So not only do you need to know the right question that you're asking, you need to know, um, you need to use these sophisticated tests to try and find it out. You need to know exactly how that one was produced. So did the, did the beekeeper feed them sugar water? I don't know. And the way to test that is to look for that signature in the sugar, the carbons that are in the sugars, 
but then to compare it with the carbons that are in the proteins. And the protein in honey comes from the bee spit. So any protein in honey is actually just bee enzymes. And so if the bees have been eating that sugar, they should also have that C4 sugar, C4 signature. Everybody is now glazed over. Excellent. <laughs> Time for a gross example again. <laughs> oh, there's my bees eating sugar water. Should have gone to that. Right, so a simple, simple food, honey, simple as it gets. And we have all these incredible um, forensic toolkits in, in science that we can throw at it. So we can do the sugar analysis that we've talked about. We can look at the isotopes to look at whether it's authentic. You can look at the geographic origins of it because all of these isotopes sort of separate out into our landscape differently. So you get an isoscape, they call it. So you can tell where your honeys come from, and that's a big issue. Often we're getting Chinese honey that's been mis mislabeled. Sorry. Um, and then there's all these other things that we can, we can do to it. So it's, it's incredibly complex. And so sometimes you just throw out all of these forensic toolkits in science, and you just look at the paperwork. So Manuka honey is extremely expensive. The New Zealand produces 1,500 tons of it. We buy 9,000 tons every year from around the world. The UK alone eats 1,800 tons. So sometimes it's a matter of forensic accounting. Um, and, and that's not a great ending to it. But yes, you can throw all of this stuff at it. And sometimes it's just looking at the paperwork. OK. Where am I? So some of the food fraud discussions that have been going on, people are talking about some sort of, you know, an app we can get on our phone that we scan and say, here you go. Um, this has clearly been adulterated. There's never going to be some Star Trek tricorder version that we can point at our, at, at our food and determine how it's been adulterated because there is a complexity in the food itself, and then anything could have been added to it. In 2008, when they were testing infant milk, would they have thought to look for melamine, that plastic that we associate with kitchen counters? No, but it was there. It was killing children. Um, and it has a high nitrogen content, so they were just looking to see whether it had the right amount of protein, and that's what nitrogen is. So it had the right protein, but it was Full of, it was coming from plastic. So that's not going to ever happen. <laughs> Sorry. All right, thoughts for digestion. A lot of the times we, Richard and I have both had this in, in doing the research for the book. We would talk to people, we would tell them our hideous stories, and they would be like, oh, God, who cares? Um, so there's clearly an economic cost, billions, billions of dollars. This is costing the industry itself. I mean, let alone us. Uh, you know, additional testing, uh, the loss of consumer confidence, all the um, all the recalls that they have to do. So this is we ultimately end up paying for that because all of that cost then gets passed on to the consumer. Loss of livelihoods. I mentioned that. Our ethics get compromised if we go through the supermarket with concern about how many food miles our food has traveled or uh, whether we buy farmed or wild fish. Our ethics are compromised if it's not labeled correctly. I did mention religious beliefs can be compromised and the environmental impacts and the health impacts. Um, and this was the incident of the, ch of the melamine. So 50,000 children were hospitalized, six died, um, and it was a horrendous, horrendous, if you think about the criminals who thought, OK, let's add this poison to something we're going to feed children. Um, it's disturbing. All right, but we are not useless. We have power in ourselves. So things we can do as consumers, we can reduce the number of steps in our food supply. Reduce the number of hands that our food's passing through. It reduces the number of opportunities that they have. Buy recognizable food. <laughs> Simple. Means you have to spend a little bit more time, as Barbara was talking about, doing all of that preparation, but it's worth it. 
buy from retailers you trust. I heard someone do an interview and she said, you know what, actually, you probably learn way more from the person you buy from than you do from the label. So even if you don't have, you know, you don't go out for dinner with your retailer, if you at least have a confidence that if you have an issue and you go back to them, you will feel good and confident that they can go back to their supply network and understand what's, um, where their food is coming from. Know the story of your food. Uh, farmed salmon is substituted for wild salmon far more when wild salmon is out of season. Uh, someone was telling me about, on the radio today, on CFAX, um, Terry Moore was saying that he saw blueberries that were for British, British Columbia blueberries completely out of season. He said, uh, I don't think so. So if you know the story of your food, you have less chance of being swindled. And this is my own personal pet peeve or my own personal um, soapbox. So I talked about having that database, that, that database we have when we smell the milk. Um, it's sort of critical to have that comprehensive database. So if I look at, I have an eight-year-old son, and I look at some of the food that his friends eat. And if, you're ch if a child has been raised on ethyl methyl, uh, ethyl methyl phenylglycidate, which is the fancy word for strawberry flavoring, then that's what's in their database. They can still tell the difference between that fake strawberry flavor and, and a real strawberry, but they'll have a preference for the fake one. And when they go to do their own discernment later in life, their database is filled with this molecule rather than you know, the wholesome strawberry. Um, and I th think we're doing a disservice to children when we aren't letting them build this very comprehensive and diverse database, and, and ourselves. Um, yeah, this is an issue that every government has, not just Canada, but limited resources. And of course, when you have limited resources, you have priorities. And so food safety, the way we handle food, the bacteria, um, contamination of food, is always going to make more people sick. So that is always going to be a priority. Um, and that's where they put their issues. So what governments around the world are doing is instead looking for triggers. They're looking for um, an indicator of where to look in the haystack. So it's a, you know, trying to find that needle in the haystack. So things like they're, they're developing information, taking in information from all sorts of social media, um, all sorts of places as to crop failures, um, whether a product has been in the media a lot as having huge health benefits. That's another trigger for fraud happening. So. Uh, in the U.S., pomegranate, for instance, was highly valued and, and was being talked about a lot as, as um, to its health benefits. And they saw like a fourfold increase in the number of pomegranate products, but no more product pomegranates were being grown or imported. <laughs> so, it's I think governments with those limited resources that you're discussing are going to be looking for. They're going to be gathering intelligence to just have targeted campaigns for particular things. Uh, the examples in the book are in, again, a biased view, Roy. Uh, the examples in the book give you a, it, we cover every single food item. So fruits and veg as well. I mean, you don't think of fruit and veg being adulterated, but it can be. Um, so just knowing what's possible, surely that is, is enlightening in terms of, okay, no, I remember this. I remember this as being an example of something that was happening. So, um, so the most common way rice has uh, been prone to fraud is just simply mislabeling a more expensive rice. So a long grain rice being labeled as basmati, for example. Um, that was definitely a scam that happened in Britain and in other areas of the world. But uh, there are also some more sinister ones in that, um, believe it or not, in China they are taking plastic resin and corn st um, potato starch and making rice grains out of it. Um, and so <laughs> obviously when you cook that up, it doesn't, it's still hard because it's plastic. Um, and you can't, it's hard to think that that's actually economical that they, they can do that, but that is one of the frauds that we encountered. Uh, it is one of the biggest concerns facing uh, humans on the face of the planet at the moment. 
Um, and it, unfortunately, uh, in all of, in so many of our cases, we found that uh, the poorest people were the most vulnerable to fraud. So I talked about the fact that, you know, it was the working class that went to the Saturday night markets. Um, and the most disturbing cases of fraud happen in developing countries. So in India, they make fake milk using detergent, oil, and urea with a little bit of milk powder added in. So uh, you're right, it's gonna be, it's, uh, and it's almost always, if you look at who's buying the ready meals, the highly processed food, which is most vulnerable to fraud, it is uh, a particular segment of the population. So uh, I don't know what, <laughs> I don't have an answer for that, but it is unfortunate and um, it is a challenge that I know lots of people are working on. All of them were motivated by making money, and none of them were motivated like, oh, I think I can make this a better place, a better world. I mean, we make, we make fake food all the time. We make cheese substitutes, right? So, I mean, that, that, that's a valid form of food production, food fraud, it's not fraud, it's um, a valid um, creation of food to create these sort of uh, new products that you know, are more accessible to more people, so fake, uh, soy cheese, etc. So I think that's a really great example. I thought we opened the book up with the fake egg because I thought that that was incredibly innovative and I never would have thought that you could make a fake egg. And they use sodium alginate, which it comes from brown seaweed and it, we, most of us would be familiar with it as the little jelly stuff that is in wet cat food. Um, and you, uh, chefs will use it to, they'll mix in say melon juice and then they can make these lovely little melon caviar that goes on your dessert or whatever. So it's, it's a valid food additive that is being used. You soak it in calcium chloride, which um, is used in sports drinks and to solidify uh, soy um, tofu. And they make the egg white, they dye a little bit of that yellow, they make an egg yolk and they, when they mix it into this, okay, so there's, here's the egg white, the, the, they have a little mold, the egg yolk is being made there on the right, they'll drop that egg yolk into the egg white and then the whole thing is actually, it's just quite jelly. Um, and then you, they wrap it up in um, gypsum and paraffin wax to make the shell. Uh, and then they put it in egg cartons and sell it at market. And by the time people get it home, they don't and realize that it's a fake egg because the fakes don't have that little thin membrane just underneath the shell. Uh, the person who sold it is long gone and moved on to the next town. So I thought that that was the most innovative in terms of food fraud. And you don't think a whole egg, you don't think. I mean, mixtures of food, sure, but a whole egg? Surely it's not economical. You'd rather just keep a chicken. But in fact, it was about a quarter of the cost of keeping chickens a great green olive oil had the hardest time getting it out into consumers because we were used to this rancid olive oil that we were getting that was months old. And um, so it was tr trying to you know, re-educate consumers about what it should really taste like. And so we have a responsibility. Uh, government has a responsibility, industry has a responsibility, but we as consumers also have a responsibility um, to make sure that we know what is good food. And that is my final message and I just wanted to say a heartfelt thank you to all of you coming out on a Friday um, and to my publisher, uh, Penguin Random House, the publicist for you, Vic, for hosting. Great to be here. Uh, to Barbara for, for introducing me, Crystal Fan for organizing everything and all of our friends and my friends and family. I say our because it was Richard and I. People stopped talking to us because they saw us coming and they said, oh God, I don't want to know what you learned today. <laughs> Um, so they have been very tolerant and uh, thank you.